Next up, we have our next speaker, a colleague of mine, um, not only an amazing uh, support engineer who has helped me personally a lot with complex issues, but he's also my main foosball arch nemesis over here in the office, and he's going to talk about what's new in 5.2. So let's welcome on the stage Edgar Smelveris. Welcome. Thank you, Arthur. So, uh, as Arthur said, my name is Edgar, and I, today I will tell you about uh, what's new in Zobbix 5.2. So let's go ahead and start. So there are more than 35 new features and improvements. Uh, about some of them I will tell you in more details. About some of them we will have another talk. And some of them I will only mention. So let's go ahead and start. First of all, synthetic monitoring. This is something that people have been doing in different ways. So you could not do it directly in Zabbix. So you needed to do some additional scripting. Now it will be possible to do it in Zabbix. So why do we need it? Well, first of all, there are cases where you can just go directly and get some metric out of a host or whatever else. So you need to do multiple steps like log in one place and get a result from another place. So previously, this was not possible. You could only do one direct check in Zabbix. Now you can do very complex scenarios. For example, uh, case where we need to first log in into some API. When we log in, we get some authentication token, which we then need to use on another address. So we use that authentication token, get some value from some address slash status, and then do something with the values we got there, like use uh, dependent items to extract something specific or just pre-processing for one value. Another use case where we have some workflow, complex workflow, and we need to test all of it. Is it all working from start to the end? So an example here, we can see Zabbix API. So there is a process which would automatically create hosts in Zabbix, maybe sometimes even delete them. And we need to check if this is working okay. So what we do in that script is we first connect to Zabbix API, create a host get a result. If the result doesn't contain any, any errors, we continue to the next step. If it contains errors, uh, return zero, and then have a trigger which will go off if it returns zero. As a next step, we actually uh, connect to API and execute different method called host get. If that one fails, again, return zero. If it succeeds, continue. On the last step, we delete this host because this is a temporary test host. Again, if it fails, return zero. If it succeeds, return one, which means that uh, this is working, the whole workflow is working. Okay, next step. Uh, if we have a situation where we don't know how many values we will need to get, so on a general basis, if we have some place where we can get information from where we need to get data, we could create an LLD, get all the information, create items from prototypes and monitor them. But this can be too slow and uh, it's very hard to automatically do some calculations out of all the values you got there. So in this example, we again go to some address and get all uh, possible values, let's say all addresses we need to go to. Then we go to all of those addresses, get all the results and do some calculations like some average or whatever else you need. So how does this work? Well, actually it's very uh, simple, very similar to how people have been doing it previously. Only instead of using external scripts, you can now use uh, Zabbix internal item called script and write your own JavaScript. So it's great because you do not need to worry about if this script is available on proxies. If it's uh, maybe some dependencies available on proxy. No, if you have a proxy, use this script. It will work on that proxy and on the next one also. So next feature I'd like to tell you a little bit about is storage of secrets in external vaults. So in version 5.0, we introduced a new feature where you could uh, use secret macros. So user can create a macro uh, enter a value, which would be some sensitive information like a password or something else, and 
then would select it to be a secret macro and user can no longer see it, even a super admin cannot retrieve it in the front end. But there was one big problem in the database, it was still stored in plain text. So if you have access to this database I or agree. a backup, you yes, can see. Yes, please do it. And so now this great new feature allows you to actually store such values in an external vault where they will be encrypted. But I won't go into more details here because my colleague Haspars will give a more detailed speech about security and he will also tell you about this new feature. Uh, next, so Zabbix Insights. So we already have quite a lot of trend data. It's already there, but mostly it is only being used for graphs. So now we have a new feature which will allow us to look at longer periods of data in trends. So uh, examples. For some reason, in September, traffic is increased. We can get something like that out of Zabbix now. Or for some reason, this week, on-site customers, uh, amount of on-site customers decreased by 12%. Again, we can get this information out of Zabbix by using the new trigger functions, which work with trends. So they will be able to analyze long-term data. They will oh, um, okay. use terms like weeks, months, or maybe even years. And this will allow you to identify anomalies and other things much easier. But again, there will be a talk from my colleague Alex, which will go into details about this. Okay, and another thing where I won't go too deep, because again, this will be covered by Arthur's, but if you want to watch his speech, I will just tell you that there are much more granular permissions now possible with Zabbix. So you can actually tell uh, each of the user to have very specific only maps or let's say only some other part of the front end or don't allow or allow API. And if you allow API, you can tell them to only have specific methods available. For example, create hosts, delete hosts, but do not create or delete or modify templates. Okay, but as I said, Arthur's will cover this. Next, one really, really huge improvement in Zabbix. So Internet of Things monitoring. So how we achieve this? So there are two new protocols which Zabbix now supports, Modbus and MQTT. So let's go through each of them. So Modbus, it is a very widely used uh, protocol for uh, accessing, talking to uh, industrial electronic devices. And we now have uh, introduced this protocol into Zabbix and Zabbix agent and agent two can now talk in Modbus to these devices using TCP or serial connections. Okay, in more details. So there is a new item key, Modbus get, which you can use to uh, access this data. You need to at least provide an endpoint possibly some of the other optional parameters if you need them. And this should work from both agents. Okay, next also new feature, uh, sorry, uh, Modbus. Yes, so you can see some examples of keys. Okay, now MQTT, and this is basically a standard and most Internet of Things devices uh, know and work with this protocol. And Zabbix now has a native solution for monitoring these MQTT brokers. But this is only supported by Agent 2 and as an active check. So the item key, new item key, MQTT get, where you need to provide at least the topic to what you want to uh, subscri subscribe to and possibly maybe authentication data or broker URL. Okay, and then you subscribe to that topic and you will get information out of your Internet of Things devices and get them in Zabbix. And well, once in Zabbix, you can do whatever you want with that data. Okay, next topic, uh, time zones for each user. So a lot of Zabbix users uh, are working in huge multinational companies. Uh, in a lot of cases, parts of the teams are located in different parts of the world and they live in different time zones. So previously, it was only possible to set time zone for the whole uh, web server. So now it is possible to change it for each user. So on the screen, you can see a result from the same exact Zabbix installation, the same exact front end, only two different users with different time zone settings. 
and you can see for one of the users it's a bit past nine in the evening for another one well it's late afternoon okay another feature uh, which will allow Zabbix to be easy uh, deployed in more easier ways in cloud or uh, using Kubernetes for the front end. So we now support full load balancing for user interface and API. So previously you could do it, but you needed to use session persistence. This is no longer true. So you can use tools like uh, AJ Proxy and deploy the front ends as needed using uh, Docker in Kubernetes or whatever else. Maybe automate it, deploy more if they're overloaded, or shut them down if so, so many are not needed. And your users don't notice the difference, they just access your front end and it keeps working. So this is really great. It, it's much more efficient to design it this way. Okay, for import export data, we now support YAML language. So previously, you know, we had XML. After that, we introduced JSON. Now we also have uh, YAML, which in my opinion is much more user friendly. It's much more readable. You can see the differences here. So even JSON, which I like better than XML, still lots of uh, unneeded data, which makes it hard to read. So now with YAML, it's simpler and it makes modifying these uh, configuration exports before importing back simpler so people can just manually change something as needed. Okay, some template improvements. First of all, we have uh, renamed lots of templates. You can see on the left side uh, previous names for templates. So they always included template, maybe app, maybe module or something and a very long name. So these were becoming very, very long and it was becoming hard to see what you're actually working with. So on new installations, we have renamed this. So new installations, you can see an example on the right side, a screenshot from new installation. This is how the templates will be called. But you need to remember that if you upgrade to Zabbix 5.2, you will not see this because during an upgrade, we do not touch your data. We don't know if you've changed anything, if you've modified this template. So better safe than sorry, we don't touch it. If you want to use it on installation which has been upgraded, you need to either rename them yourselves or download them and import into your installation. Okay, some more template improvements. So templated screens have now been converted to dashboards. So we now have templated dashboards and this offers you all the new great functionality of dashboards in templated screens. Uh, thing people are very happy about, uh, if you go to templates, people were asking for an easy way to identify all hosts which are linked to this template. Previously, you had to go to hosts, you had to enter as a template name in the filter, and then you could see it. Now, it's no longer true. If you go to the templates, you can just click on hosts and you are immediately brought to the same place, list of hosts filtered by this template. So very convenient. Okay, number of templates is now also displayed uh, in simpler way in system information. So you no longer have to look at hosts and try to figure out from there which of these are templates. Okay, uh, now for discovery and cloud monitoring and including VMware monitoring. Really great new feature is host interfaces can now be discovered from LLD. So previously, one big problem we had was um, if you discover virtual machines running on VMware, you could not uh, easily do VMware monitoring on that virtual machine and also agent monitoring. So by default, the newly created host had the master host address interface. So you could not access the agent from the same host. Now there is a new option. You can choose custom and you can use, well, any uh, LLD macro you get out of your discovery. So there is an example here from VMware, but we're not limited to that. So if you have uh, introduced some way to monitor your cloud or whatever else, and if you can't get that uh, IP address from there, you can set it up. And now on the same host, you will be able to monitor both data from your virtualization and from Zabbix agent. 
Also, it is no longer mandatory to have hosts uh, with interfaces. So if you need to have a host, uh, which will be like a dummy host only for some calculated or aggregated items, previously you always had to create an interface. This is no longer true. So now you can create a dummy host without an interface at all. And as for host prototypes, it is also now possible to discover tags and uh, define tags from your LLD macros. Okay, next improvements in user interface. So I really like this. So you can save a lot of filters now. For example, here in problems, previously, if you wanted to predefine some view from problems, you could only do it in dashboards. So you either needed to create different dashboards for different case scenarios, or you needed to create different widgets in the same uh, dashboard, which was not always convenient. So now if you just go to monitoring problems, uh, create a filter and save it, as you can see here in tabs. And if you're looking at some other filter, you can immediately see at the top that there are one problems in some other saved view or some amount in a different view. Okay, um, we, if you create maintenances, previously we had three different tabs you had to go through to actually define the maintenance. And honestly, there was not that much data we needed to fill in each of the tabs. So now those tabs are removed all of the data can be filled in just one screen and you can see there is not so many fields here. I think it is much more convenient this way. Okay, um, a problem that I have personally had, when you go and clone an item and spend a lot of time troubleshooting why is the item returning incorrect data, incorrect information, only to find out later on that the item you cloned from had a preprocessing step so now it will be much easier to identify problems like these, not only with preprocessing, but in other places in Zabbix. So it will be possible to clearly identify that uh, there is something defined in some other tab. So it, it will no longer be that easy to, well, make a mistake like that. Okay, uh, also it is now possible to define default language. So when you need to change it for all users or change the login screen for new users, it is now possible to do it. Still, if a user changes his own pass, uh, sorry, language, then he still uses that one. Okay, and uh, lots of essential user parameters are now moved from a file of, on the web server to database accessible through the user interface. So to change these parameters, you no longer need to log into the server and modify something which could be overwritten uh, if you do an update. But now it is uh, possible to configure them in the interface and store it in the database, much more convenient. Okay, and in Zabbix 5.0, we introduced a really great feature, possibility to test items which have not yet been even created on a template level or wherever. But there was a problem, this did not work with SNMP, so now, you can also test SNMP. You can define SN all SNMP settings, address, port, version, community, or if it's version three, maybe encryption settings also. And also, because some users have a lot of filters, uh, a lot of dashboards, we now can filter those dashboards. Okay, so a small improvement, but pretty convenient. Some more uh, improvements in pre-processing. So it is now possible to use macros in JavaScript preprocessing. And this, by the way, is also backported into version 5.0. So newer versions of 5.0 also have this functionality. So if you have some user-defined macro, you can now use it in your preprocessing steps with JavaScript. Also, um, we had one problem with Zabbix, especially for cases where you had an item which would only check if something is up. If it's up, it returns a value. If it's not up, sometimes it would go unsupported. So the only way you could actually detect that something is wrong is by using no data trigger, which can sometimes be tricky. So now there is an option. If your item goes unsupported, you can override this and you can set some custom on fail setting like discard value 
or set it to some specific value and then create a trigger on it, which will fire immediately as soon as this item would go unsupported previously. Okay, and some more improvements. Uh, I really love this one. Uh, in support, this will be very, very useful. So sometimes there are problems when we do not know why, but some cache is filling up in Zabbix, or we can't figure out why is it used so much. So now there is a command line parameter. It's also possible to execute using API. So uh, runtime command, diagnostic information, can be executed just as diagnostic information, as then it will output contents of all caches, or you can specify a specific cache then it will output the information of what is stored in this specific cache. It will allow us a much easier way to uh, troubleshoot problems. Okay, so some more improvements. Uh, it was previously possible if, to, to check if a user exists in Zabbix. You could just try to log in five times incorrectly, and then Zabbix would display, well, user is now blocked. So this is no longer possible. You cannot check if a user exists in Zabbix. Uh, unsupported items. So previously, if an item went unsupported, we had a special setting for it. By default, that item would be checked only after 10 minutes. This was okay for items with small update intervals, but this turned out to be a problem if your items are normally updated once an hour or once a day. Then Zabbix would create additional load by trying to update these items. So this is no longer used. Uh, now Zabbix will use item update interval instead of refresh and supported items. So another option, uh, only useful for HTTP agents items. So it has an option timeout. Other uh, items do not have it. And previously it was not possible to mass update that timeout setting. Now you can do it. Uh, also, in webhooks, it is now possible to get uh, headers in HTTP response. This will be very useful for integrations. Okay, and if you are using any user parameters, uh, if you execute them, now you have a default directory, or let's say you have a way to define a default directory where Zabbix will search for uh, any passes that you mention there or try to execute scripts from there. Okay, and uh, user macros can now be up to 2048 characters long. Okay, and a couple of more. So active agent can now work as multiple hosts. So when you needed to differentiate some checks uh, logically and do them on different hosts, but it would still come from the same physical host. So previously there was no easy way to do it. You either had to uh, run two agents or figure out some other strange workaround, at least with active checks. So now it is possible to tell Zabbix agent to work as multiple hosts in active checks. So it will connect the Zabbix server to identify as host one, get checks for host one, also identifies host two and get those checks separately and as many hosts as you have defined here. Okay, now Docker images are officially supported and uh, there are these special event log macros, which could be used in a lot of places, but previously they were not uh, used in operational data. So if you do Windows event log monitoring, you see something like severity or event ID, those macros were available, but you could not use them in operational data. So now you can. Okay, and also user macros now support uh, item description. So you can use them in item description. Okay, so I hope uh, you like all this. And now there's a question. What to do if you want to upgrade immediately as soon as it came out? Well, simple. So how to upgrade from version 5? First of all, back up the database, possibly back up some other external scripts or whatever else you have, but definitely back up the database. Uh, downgrade is not supported for major releases. Okay, then simply upgrade the Zabbix packages. So if you have Zabbix server on one server, upgrade Zabbix server there. If you have front end on a different server, upgrade those packages, but all major packages of Zabbix should be upgraded. 
Next, restart Zabbix server. It might happen automatically, depending on how you upgrade the packages, and it will automatically start upgrading the DB schema. So all you need to do is watch the log file, and if all goes well, it will just tell you DB schema upgrade finished, and it will start Zabbix server, and now you will be running version 5.2. Okay, and after that, also don't forget to upgrade all proxies. Working with different major versions of proxies is not supported, so you do need to upgrade proxies. And as a last step, which is optional, update agents. So Zabbix can work with older agents, it is supported, so you don't need to do it immediately, but overall, it is recommended, because you will get all the new functionality. Or, if you want to, you can always contact us, uh, where experienced engineers will do that job for you. So minimal downtime, probably much faster, uh, less hassle, and well, we guarantee that we will get the job done. Okay, so that's all I wanted to tell you today. Thank you, and you can ask any questions you want. Okay, uh, hello, I'm here with Edgars, and let's answer some of the questions from our community. So, Edgars, are you ready to answer those questions? Sure. Okay, so let's begin. Um, first off, so about the new item type, about the script item type. So, how is script better than using HTTP check with JavaScript preprocessing? Well, first of all, it's a bit hackish solution. So, yeah, you can do a lot of things in, in JavaScript preprocessing but you're limited to what you can do in the first check, so the agent or the HTTP agent or whatever. So a script is a much more convenient way to do it uh, normally, not using some hackish workarounds. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, yeah, I think I agree. Um, I also think you can achieve a bit more in the initial kind of first step if you're using that script item, um, something that I think wouldn't be possible with uh, HTTP plus JavaScript preprocessing, especially if we're talking about uh, like authentication tokens, grabbing those and then passing those and things like that. Um, next up, uh, regarding the new fillers, filters uh, functionality, will using a lot of filters with the preview enabled, uh, will that have some impact on the front-end performance? I'm pretty sure if you are already have performance issues there, then yes. But uh, overall, probably not as big. If, if it work, works okay right now, I don't think you'll have much uh, degradation of performance there. Mm -hmm. So essentially something that I think we have kind of emphasized and talked about before. If you have performance issues, fix them before upgrading and then upgrade. I think Ed Garcia would agree with that. Yes, that's always true. Regarding the YAML configuration export, um, what happens if I still try and import an XML into 5.2? Well, all older templates are still supported. You will still be able to import them. So backwards compatibility is working. No forward compatibility. But uh, you can still even export templates using XML or uh, JSON or now also YAML. So three options. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. Let's see next up, what do we have here? Okay, let's say I have an agent with multiple host names, all right? So what happens if I just plug in a very huge amount of host names? Is that going to impact the performance of my agent at all? Well, the only reason there is if you have a huge amount of items that uh, the agent will spend a lot of time collecting the data. If you just add more hosts and each host doesn't have that many items, then no problem. If you uh, just collect the same data on all the hosts, yeah, of course, you'll have some impact there. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's all kind of some basic general configuration questions and you covered them. So thank you and uh, let's hope everyone feels good about setting up 5.2 and testing out those new features that you covered. Thank you. Thank you. Um,